So today we are going to pick up the uh, sort of a segment of the course where we talk about structures. And what we mean by structures is basically, you know, well, I guess up till now, most of the problems that we've solved have uh, not involved that many pieces, right? And a lot of them are just one piece, right? Where you, you're trying to figure out all the forces that act on a particular piece, right? Uh, it gets just a little bit more tricky now because what we're going to try to do is put more than one piece all together into a larger structure. And that's why we kind of refer to this as structures, right? There's these uh, bigger things where we can determine all of the forces that are acting inside of this bigger uh, piece or bigger structure uh, by using some of the same techniques that we've already looked at. And so in particular, what we're going to start with, they're called trusses. Okay, so by way of introduction here, <coughs> I've showed a very simple truss up there, the very top of the screen. Um, this truss, I, uh, I'm drawing it a particular way. I'm drawing it such as it, it looks like all these little links that have pins at the ends of them. And then those pins also connect those links to other links, right? And I, I won't always draw trusses like this, okay? So... The reason why is that it's a little bit more of a hassle to draw all of those links looking like links, okay? So a shortcut that we often do to draw uh, a structure like this is instead of drawing it exactly like that, we just use lines, right? And we just, you know, show a place where a pin would connect multiple members together by uh, like a, a dot like this, right? So that we could represent basically the same uh, structure in a little bit more simplified way and we all know what we mean, okay? All right, so uh, let me actually also name some things on here so that we're not confused when we look at these criteria that I have listed below right there to talk about what it is that we need to know that we've got a truss, okay? So one of the words that you see used in here is members, okay? And uh, probably most of you have a good idea without necessarily having to be told, but these are the members, right? The members are all the little links, okay? Those are, those are known as members of the truss, and the ones on the other side to, are two. I just don't want to draw all those lines, okay? So those are the members. Um, there's another word that gets used right here, right? Pins, Okay. What I want to say about that is pins are often, you know, the, the word pins with respect to trusses like this is often interchangeable with this other word that I use down here, joints, okay? So we kind of mean the same thing when we talk about pins and when we talk about joints uh, in a truss like this, okay? And the, those pins or joints, uh, probably not surprisingly, are these little uh, locations right here, pins or joints. Okay. One thing I don't have listed up here uh, is the word supports. All right. So you guys probably have an idea of what those are as well. Where do you think the supports are? These things, right? So these are supports. And where you have the supports, does that imply that there is some kind of a force acting there? Okay. And so... Um, I want to give us this idea of where the idea of external forces comes from for a structure like this, okay? And rather than draw it on the top picture, uh, let me show uh, the bottom picture, the same truss, but now let me show that truss. Let me slide it over a bit, give me some room. Let me so show that same truss so that it actually has an applied force, Okay. Uh, and I'll just call it F for right now. I can also say that this thing down here, right now it represents a free body diagram, right? How do I know that I can call it a free body diagram? Because I freed it from the supports, right? Okay. Um, actually, let me show you one thing before I, I go on with this. Sometimes you will see a symbol like this or a sim and a symbol like this. What do you think those represent? Okay, on the left end, 
that represents the same thing as the left end of the top picture. It says that location is pinned in place. All, you know, anytime you see hash marks like this underneath a part, that basically means we're saying something is keeping it from moving right there. All right, it says that's fixed. Um, and so another way of representing that pin that we have on the left is with that little triangle underneath that pin. On the right, we've got this roller, and the roller has an effect of allowing motion left and right, but restraining motion up and down. Okay? Same thing as the little skateboard looking thing that I showed on the right side. Right? So I want you to be familiar with what these symbols look like and what they mean, but let me go back to making this a free body diagram. Okay. If, if uh, I want to properly represent those reactions that I have on there, what should I do on the left side? How many reactions? A vertical one and a horizontal one, someone says. Good job. Okay. And you might call this something like RY or RX. Okay. Something like that. Although, a lot of times, we need to be more specific once we get into a structure because a structure has all these different pieces to it. So another technique you'll see me do a lot of times is label some stuff. I might label each of these joints with a letter. That's a very common way that I try to express to you. Um, you know, if I need to express to you and identify a particular member, I can do it by naming two joints and then that identifies a member, for instance, okay? So like member AB, you would know what that was because I named joint A and joint B, and that's the one that connects A and B, okay? But anyway, um, I might not want to name those just Rx and Ry because of Y. Like maybe R means reaction to me, but I'm going to end up needing to have another reaction over here that's in the Y direction, so I need to be a little more specific. So maybe I'll want to call this Rax. R-A-Y, something like this, or this R-C-Y. Okay? All right, but I, I said we were going to talk a little bit about what is an internal force versus what is an external force. Okay? And this is a good picture to help us remember what an internal force is versus an external force. Okay? Uh, basically, the, the, uh, the structure, when it's all held together, can hold forces inside of itself. In other words, each member might be carrying a force, but we don't care about that because when we have it all put together like this in one free body diagram, we assume it will hold itself all together and we're not asking questions about how much force internally it takes for it to hold itself together, right? That, and this is a good point. Every time you do a free body diagram, the only thing the free body diagram can give you are external forces. Right? That's the only thing that you're going to represent on a free body diagram, is external forces. Okay? So that means if we want to know the internal forces, what do we have to do? Okay, we have to break it up in some way. Right? We have to take what's all put together and break it apart in some sort of a way to, to know how much force is in each individual part. And for the next two lectures here, we're going to see two different ways of thinking about breaking this thing up in order to know what the forces are inside uh, of the truss, okay? So that's, you know, all of the forces I've put on the picture there, RAX, RAY, F, and RCY, those are all external forces to that free body diagram or to that structure, okay? Um, internal forces would be the ones carried in the individual members. Okay, now let's talk about these rules that I put down here. You've been looking at them, so let's talk about them, okay? To have a truss, here's, here are your necessary conditions that you have to have in order to have a truss, okay? You've got to have a structure where uh, all the connections between your members have to behave as if they are frictionless pins, okay? And when we say frictionless pins there, what do we mean? Okay, so the comment was made, maybe there's no force acting. We have to be a little more precise than that. There is a type of influence that's, that we assume is not acting there, but it's not a force. A moment, right? It means that those pins will not react moments to each other. They're, they won't react a rotational effect to the other ones. 
Okay, does that make sense? They, they are free to rotate wherever those pins are connected. On the other hand, they can transmit forces uh, in any direction at the pin. Okay, uh, so that's what we mean by a frictionless pin. And it says all of those connections between members must behave like frictionless pins. So a quick question for you. Up till now, you probably had an idea of what a truss was based on driving across bridges. Maybe. Has anyone referred to a truss bridge and you had an idea that, hey, th I'm going across a truss right here. Okay. So when you've gone across truss bridges, what do the joints look like? Okay, you might see like a big I-beam coming in here. You might see another I-beam kind of thing coming in here and maybe another one going out right here. And what is it that holds them all together? Okay, there's actually, this thing's got a name. A lot of times they'll call something like this a gusset plate. Okay, and in the, where these things connect, there might be a series of bolts on each one that would bolt these things together. Have you ever seen something like that when you're going across a bridge? Okay. Well, if that's the case, does that connection look like it's a frictionless pin? Why not? Okay. You have enough, you know, intuition about a connection like that to say that if you tried to twist one member relative to another rotationally at that point, that connection wouldn't allow it. Okay. But let me, let me give you a little bit of help here, though. Just because we officially can't have any moments reacted between members at the joints, right? We a lot of times use assumptions in engineering. Have you noticed that? OK. And here's the thing. As long as these members are long enough relative to the strength of those plates, in other words, the, the strength of that plate to react a moment to another one of the members may not be very large, right? And when I say strength, I, I should probably also say it's not always just strength. Sometimes it's about stiffness. Like maybe it's not stiff enough to be able to react a large amount of moment from one piece to another. And because of that, it's close enough, you know, for the analysis of a lot of the structures, who are, even the ones that are built like that, it's close enough to analyze it as if it had a frictionless pin there, even though it doesn't. Okay? So, and uh, I, I don't have any problem saying that. All right? It, it probably is, in most of those cases, close enough to pretend like it's got a frictionless pin there. Okay? All right, so that was, we, we just got stuck on rule number one right there, didn't we? So, first rule, connections between the members must behave like fr frictionless pins. Second rule, each member is connected at exactly two locations. Not more, not less. Okay, so you notice on this uh, diagram that I have up here that you know the initial truss that I showed you, you're seeing there that uh, each of those members is only connected at two places. Right, and then lastly, I spent a long time talking about this word right here, external. Right, external loads can only be applied to the joints of the truss, okay? We can't do something like this and say, I'm going to apply a force right here, okay? Now, you could physically, right? There's, there's nothing that would stop you from, from uh, applying a force like that to a truss, but when you do, that structure would no longer really be a truss, okay? Um, some people might argue with me on that point and might just say, well, yeah, but there might be segments of the overall structure that still behave like a truss, and I would concede that point, all right? But officially, to ha really have a truss, you're supposed to only load it at the joints, okay? And there's an interesting thing, an interesting question a lot of people have at this point. Well, what do you do with self-weight then? Okay? Oh, uh, self-weight. Okay, there's two things you can do. What I'm going to say we're going to do in almost all cases in here, we're going to ignore it. Okay, when we do that, what we're not, you know, we're not saying it doesn't have self-weight. What we're saying is 
that for a lot of the structures we will analyze, the forces that are involved in uh, you know, the rest of it, in other words, the externally applied forces that aren't weight, uh, will cause forces in all the members that are large enough to the point where maybe the weight is insignificant. All right? It won't make much of a difference to have to deal with the weight. The other way we can do it, okay, which we won't really do much in this class, but it's, I want you to know that it exists, the other way we can deal with the self-weight is we can split it 50-50 as long as the uh, member has kind of uniform weight per length, right? If you, if you have uniform weight per length, you can split that weight up between the two joints that it's connected to. And that's, you, you'll get a good enough answer by putting those two weights, uh, or the, you know, half the weight on one of the joints it's connected to and half the weight on the other joint it's connected to, okay? So I'll say here, that's another way you can handle it, is split between joints. Okay? But for right now, we're just going to, most of the time, we're just going to ignore it. All right. So the consequence of these three conditions that we're setting for ourselves to have a truss is that every member that we have in this structure is going to be what's called a two-force member. And I've discussed that a little bit you know, kind of mildly with you guys in here a couple of times, but let's look at it and uh, make sure we understand what a two-force member is. Okay? So let me say it this way. If we have a member that is only connecting at two locations and it's connecting at those two locations with frictionless pins, then there can only be two places where we apply force and there aren't any moments. Okay, and so where before, where we have two pins, we might have said, well, a pin can react, you know, two different reactions, p possibly, right? So we would have we would have said something like this. Okay. Now, let's think through our free body diagram and the resulting equilibrium equations if that's the free body diagram that we're dealing with. Okay. And let's say that we say that one of these forces is non-zero, okay? So we'll say this one right here is not equal to zero. Okay, so that little force right there, let's just say for now, um, just to kind of mentally process this, what if that one was not equal to zero? What would the only way be for this uh, body to be in equilibrium vertically? Because there's nothing else applied to it. These are the only two locations, and they're pins, so we're putting the two reactions we always expect out of a pin on there, right? The only way for it to not uh, be accelerating vertically is actually for this force. Let me actually show it the direction it would have to go, right? It would have to react with whatever the magnitude was of the one that was on the left in order for that, like a y equation that we would write in that direction to be equal to zero. Well, if those two are like that, then um, what's going to be the effect on this member assuming that this is non-zero length between the two pins? It's going to tend to try to rotate the thing. Okay. Now let's think about are there any influences that could be acting on it that could react against those, that against that tendency to rotate? Okay. Let me show you this. These two share a common line. So if you're summing moments, let's say anywhere on that line, what you will find is that you will have an unreacted moment and you don't have any way to react the moment. So what do we conclude? Okay, We conclude that this assumption that we made way back here at the beginning can't be true. That can't be non-zero. Okay? meaning it has to be zero. All right, so I'm going to get rid of those and say we can only have forces that act along the axis of the member in order for it to stay in equilibrium, assuming these rules hold, right? Assuming that we're only connecting with frictionless pins at two locations and no external forces are being applied. Okay, now, if I actually want to draw these 
arrows correctly, I could, you know, to where they look like they're reacting against one another, what direction would I have to draw them? Uh, someone says opposite each other. So let me actually draw these like this. Okay? If I draw reactions onto this member in that direction, what's the effect going to be on the member of the forces that are implied by those two arrows? It'll try to stretch it, right? It's trying to pull it longer. Whenever that's happening, this member is thought to be in tension. That's how we refer to a member like this. Okay? What's the only other possibility? Maybe they push in like this. And that's known as compression. Okay, and the effect of a, of a direction of force like that would be to try to make the thing shorter. Okay, you with me so far? All right, now I've got an interesting one to ask you. So put your, uh, put your Newton's Laws hat on so that you're thinking about it. What is the effect of this upper member on the joints that it would be connected to? So this member, the, you know, the tension member up there, would be connected to, to joints in the truss. Let me draw the joint right here. This is one of those joints on the left side it's connected to. And let's say this is the other joint over here on the right side that it's connected to. The effect that's happening on the member is to try to make it longer, which may, means these arrows are pulling outward. But what does that mean as far as the effect that happens on the joints? Okay, Newton's third law says for every action there's an equal opposite reaction, right? That means that it would try to pull those joints closer, right? So you think of the joints trying to pull the member longer, the member is trying to pull the joints closer, right? And that's the struggle that's going on uh, in this epic battle. Okay, something like this. What about if you assume compression? Okay, it just reverses, right? If, we're, if the forces are trying to push the member shorter, then what that means is that the member is trying to push outward on the joints, and you'll see something more like this. Okay, and this is really important to understand this concept because a lot of times we aren't going to be actually drawing free body diagrams of the members. We're going to be drawing free body diagrams of the joints. And when we're drawing those free body diagrams of the joints, we need to make sure that we have the correct direction in mind. If we're assuming, let's say, a tension force in a member, we have to have the correct direction in mind as far as what effect that has on the joints. OK? All right, so then the next question I have before we move to the next thing is, is it OK if a member isn't straight? In other words, what if I had a member that uh, looked like this? OK, code word banana. OK, if that's, the, if that's what my member looks like, um, what would the direction of the force be acting on that member? OK. What we got to do is we got to draw a line from joint to joint. And that has got to be the line of action that is acting in this member. So, you know, we'll do, we'll do like a, maybe a dotted line from one to the other, something like this. And the force has to act, if whatever force we have here must act along a line from joint to joint, even if the member isn't straight in between those two points. <coughs> Okay. The, the member can have any shape whatsoever. As long as it's got two locations where it's connected by frictionless pins, uh, it will be a two-force member. Okay. Having said that, if it's not straight, right, if the member is not straight, it will experience stresses in the member that it otherwise wouldn't have experienced. Okay. So I don't want to minimize that possibility. But if we assume that the member is strong enough to be able to withstand it, 
then as far as the effect of the member on the rest of the structure, we don't care whether it's straight or curved, okay, or some other shape. All right, so let's look at an actual truss. Okay, so here we've got the truss that's got a pin support at A, and it's got a roller support at D. We know some dimensions uh, between uh, some of the adjacent um, joints there, both vertically as well as horizontally. And what we want to do is we want to find the forces that are carried in each of the members of this truss. Okay? We want to find all of them. All right. So typically what you do in a case like this, I'll just talk through it for just a second. There's nothing based on what you already know. There's nothing that keeps you from solving for external reactions first. Would you agree? So what do you mean? What do you think I mean by external reactions? Okay, at A or at D, right? We've got those uh, the pin support at A, and we've got a roller support at D, and there's nothing that keeps us from being able to solve for those external reactions first. And if I was about to just go ahead and solve this before really showing you guys how it worked and how to do it, then that would probably be my first step: is to go ahead and solve for those two reactions. But you guys already know how to do that, and I would rather show you kind of the big picture of how this whole thing works together. So here's what I'm going to show you. I'm showing you the method of joints today. The method of joints involves drawing free body diagrams, not surprisingly, of joints. Okay? So the type of free body diagram we're going to draw for this thing are basically the pins. We're going to pretend like we're going to break the pins out and just look at the forces acting on the pins. And we're going to do that for all the pins. So let's actually kind of lay them all out here. Let's say this is pin A. Here we've got pin B. Here we've got pin C. And there we've got pin D. Okay, A, B, C, and D. And let's say down here we've got pin G. And down here we've got pin E. Okay? And let's go ahead and draw all of our free body diagrams right now. Okay? Does that sound good? That way we'll see how each free body diagram interacts with all the other ones. Okay? And let's just start. Do you have one you want to start with? Okay? Sure. Let's do A. Someone wants to do A? Now here's the thing. What we need to do when we're drawing these free body diagrams is we need to make an assumption about each one of the members about whether it's carrying tension or compression. You got to make an assumption about that before you can write your free body diagrams so that you write your free body diagrams consistent with one another. Okay? And my suggestion, even though you don't have to do this, my suggestion is to just go ahead right at the beginning and assume everything is in tension. All right? Even though you know it might not be. If you assume all the members are carrying tension and you run through the problem and you solve for all the forces, what do you think you'll get at the end? Some of your forces will end up negative, and how will you be able to interpret those? You'll say, it must have been the opposite of what I assumed. I assumed tension. It came out negative, must be compression. Okay? And if you just assume everything's in tension, then that to me is the easiest way to understand the whole thing. Okay? And it, it makes it to where it's easy to know what direction to draw your arrows. All right? So at A, if member AB is in tension, what direction should force act on A from member AB? Okay? Someone says to the left. All right, let's actually look up here and say, when we had a tension force, right, that top, uh, the top example right there is a tension force, what direction is it pulling on the left joint? 
on the left, this is the left joint over here. What direction is the member pulling on the joint? To the right. Okay. It's trying to pull the joints closer to each other. And remember, we're drawing free body diagrams of the joints, not of the members. Okay. So when I draw that arrow on this diagram down here, I want to match that and say, this is the effect of a tension force in member AB. Okay? And because I'm assuming tension, I also, this is a, a standard I typically use. If I assume tension, I usually use the letter T. It's like a, you know, remind myself that that's what I was assuming. T, and then I usually name it with the letters of the joints that the member connects. So that would be the tension carried in member AB. Okay? Well, if that's the tension, if that's the force acting on A from member AB, could we also put the force acting on B from member AB? And what would that do? Okay? That should point to the left. And that would also be TAB. Right? You want to name it the same thing as you named the other one because you're really looking at the two ends of the same force, right? It's the, end, the force acting on one end of the member, same force in magnitude, opposite direction, acting on the other end of the member. Okay? What else acts at A? Since we wanted to start at A, what else acts at A? Okay? AG, I think some of you were saying. So if we assume that one is in tension, it would draw A towards G and it would draw G towards A. And I could name that T-A-G. Okay. Am I done with uh, joint A? Okay. I need the reaction forces on there as well. Because it is pinned, there can be two external reactions that I need to identify at joint A. And I will just name those like I did before, R-A-X and R-A-Y, which sort of implies what? Implies that I've chosen a coordinate system. So I may as well label my coordinate system. OK? So now I, I am actually only missing one thing that I can identify on my free body diagram at joint A. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Someone says, are the X and Y supposed to be flipped here? They are not. Good catch. I was making sure, I was making sure you're awake. No. I, uh, some of you have been in my class before. I'm awful with that kind of stuff. So, you know, making sure I get it right on there. I'm in the middle of trying to make some big point, you know, and I've reversed things. So, yes. <laughs> All right. Watch me carefully. This one's X. Is that correct? All right. This one's Y. Wonderful. <laughs> Leave it in. We had a good time together, didn't we? All right, watch me carefully, right? I'm, I'm depending on you. Okay, so there's my, uh, my X and Y. Um, I, I was about to say, I'm still missing one thing on my A free body diagram. What am I missing? Okay, there's, I should have something on there that has to do with the direction of the one force on there that may not be obvious what the direction is at first glance, right? And that would be of this TAG, right? So let me give myself some more room here. And I can do that just by indicating a slope. What would the slope be of TAG, or of, yeah, of that force TAG or of member AG? It'd be the same, right? Okay, watch me carefully so I don't reverse them. A rise of four and a run of five. Okay, good deal. All right, so let's go to another joint. Maybe I won't be quite as painstaking for the rest of the joints, but what, which one do you want to go to next? 
B. Okay, it is the next letter in the alphabet. So why don't I put a force coming from member BG? Okay. I'm showing it such that BG would be carrying tension, right? So it would be drawing B towards G, right? And I'll name it T B G. Okay. What else? Is there another side to TBG? It would draw this joint G towards B. Okay. What else? Okay. TBC. That would draw B towards C and C toward B. And I'll call that TBC there and TBC here. Okay. And I won't label the uh, coordinate axes on everything else because I think it's clear enough to have them right there. Okay. Do I need anything else on joint B? Okay. I don't have BE yet, right? So let me draw that one. Which means it would be drawing E toward B. All right. And what else? What else would I need on this diagram at B? Okay. Again, I want to make sure I'm labeling the things that I need to know. So what would the slope be there? Again, a rise of four for a run of five. Okay. So I think I'm done with B. Now what? C, okay, sounds good. For C, there's going to be a force that draws C towards E and E towards C that I will name TCE and TCE. Okay. What else? There's going to be a force that draws C towards D and D towards C. I'll name that TCD and TCD here. Okay. Anything else at C? Nope. So let's move on to point D. D has uh, a, a member that connects D to E. So I'll draw that like this and like this. And I'll name it TDE and TDE. Okay. What else do I have at D? Okay, there, I need a slope on there, I agree. So the slope there would need to be a rise of four for a run of six this time, right? Okay, there's another reaction force I need to put on there in the y direction as well because of that support at D. And, and you said just in the y direction, right? Why just in the, in the y direction? Okay, because it's got those rollers there, that means it's free to move left and right. It's only being constrained up and down. So there's only a force being applied there in the vertical direction. All right, so there we have, uh, we'll call that R, D, not X, Y. Okay. So what else? We just finished D. E. All right. So E, I think we're only missing one thing on E as far as a, a force. And that would be the force that would draw E towards G. This T, uh, E, G here. And a T, E, G there. Okay. And I think we're only missing a couple of things now, like what? Some slopes, right? So this one right here is again going to have a run of six and a rise of four. Over here, this one is going to have a run 
of 5 and a rise of 4. And this one here is going to have a run of 5 and a rise of 4. Okay. Good, good thinking. Okay. Someone says, what about the loads? What do they mean? Okay. I have forces applied at G and at E. If I didn't, then this thing wouldn't have any force in any of the members, right? So I need to, need to remember those. So yes, I need to put those on there. The 500 pounds goes on G and the 700 pounds goes on E. Okay, and that is the complete idea of doing all the free body diagrams for all the joints in this body. Before I go on and try to solve anything, let's also step back and try to do just a, um, you know, a, a little bit of an inventory here to see, can we solve for everything? Okay, well, how would we know if we could? A lot of times doing a, do you have enough equations to solve for all the things you don't know? What are the numbers of those things? And because if you have enough equations for the un unknowns, very often that means you're in good shape. So let's count them up. How many unknowns do I have total for all of those free body diagrams? But let's not double count anything, right? So let's count them up. How many on the first one? There's four things I don't know, OK? Good deal. Go to the next one. How many more unknowns? Three more. OK, so how many total? OK, we're at seven. OK, let's move on to joint C. How many more? Two more. So now we're at nine. Moving on to joint D. How many more? OK, we got two more at D. Right. So how many are we at now? Eleven. So let's go down to joint E. How many new ones do I have? Okay, a lot of votes for a lot of different things. It's just one. Okay, I've already counted TBE, TCE, and TDE in looking at my other items, right? So what I was at before, was it 11 before? So now I'm at 12. Okay. And when I go to the next one, how many new unknowns? None. I've accounted for all of them already, OK, through my other free body diagrams. How many unknowns do I have total? 12. How many joints do I have? Six. How many equations can I write per joint knowing that each joint represents a concurrent force system in 2D? Two for each one. So I have 12 equations at my disposal, and I have 12 things that I don't know. So I want to make the point right here, if you've got a really nice equation solver that can do big systems of equations, there's no reason you have to do what I'm about to do, which is a sequential solution of this. That's what I'm going to show you. That's with my example, the kind of technique I'm going to use. That is, it is easiest to do a sequential solution if you're doing it by hand, right? If you're using a computer, it doesn't really matter that you do a sequential solution. You can do a simultaneous solution instead and just solve it all at once, okay? But I'm going to show you a technique where we do, instead of a, uh, a, a, a simultaneous solution, we're going to do a sequential solution through this whole thing. To do that, though, we need some place to start. Right? If we want to kind of pick through and, and uh, find all the things that we need to know on here, we need a place to start. Okay? And if you look at these joints, do any of them have only two unknowns? Two or fewer unknowns? Okay? None of them. What's the one that has the lowest number of unknowns? Okay, there's a couple, but there's a couple that have three, right? One of those is joint D. And we haven't done it yet, but I mentioned it. What's a technique I can use to find one of the forces at joint D? 
Okay, I can do a free body diagram of the whole structure and some moments, and I can find that RDY over there, right? That's a separate step from this whole thing that I just did, but it gives me an entry point to be able to start solving this thing so sequentially, okay? So, Because I don't want to show you, uh, you know, bad habits, I'm going to take this whole thing, copy it, and hope that my computer doesn't crash. Okay. And instead of showing it to you as a not free body diagram, I'm going to show it as a free body diagram by erasing these supports and showing them instead with their reaction vectors, right? So this over here, if we name it the same thing, it would be R, D, Y. And over here, this one would be R, A, not X, Y. This one's R, A, X, okay? So if that's my free body diagram, then how would I write an equation? To find R, D, Y. Okay. You could sum up Y forces and set it equal to zero. Would that immediately give you R, D, Y? Okay. Yeah, we probably want to do a moment equation instead. So let me just squeeze it in right here. I'm going to sum moments around point A. So that I'll have R D Y times what's its length, perpendicular length from that line of action of R D Y to point A. Okay, 11 plus 5 is 16. Okay, so 16 feet. Now what? Okay, minus 700 pounds times 10 feet minus 500 pounds times 5 feet. All that's equal to 0, so we can find R D Y. Okay? So let's, uh, you know, the easy way to do this is to just sort of think of doing some of it in your head, or you can just punch it into your calculator exactly as it sits. Uh, it looks to me easy enough just to put in there something like this, 700 uh, times 10 plus 500 times 5, all this over 16, which gives me 593.75 pounds of reaction at D. 593.75. Which, by the way, once I have that, how hard is it to get RAY? Pretty simple, so let me go ahead and do it. Summing forces in the Y direction, where upward is positive, we would have uh, this result we just got, 593.75 pounds, okay? minus 700 pounds, minus 500 pounds, plus RAY, all that sums up to zero. So what does RAY become? Basically, 700 plus 500 minus that answer we just got previously, 606.25. Okay, I don't have a great place to put that, but uh, I'll slide over a little bit here. <clears throat> 606.25 pounds. 
All right. While we're here, let's answer another question too. What's RAX? Okay. Yeah, it's zero. It's easy enough to see it because when you start summing forces in the x direction, you'll say RAX and you won't find any other ones. So RAX had better be zero because there's nothing that would cause a reaction in the a or in the x at point A. Okay. So that was a little sidebar we needed to do to get back to the main business of dealing with all of these free body diagrams we prepared just a second ago. But now we have, we're armed with a little more information now, like that RDY is 593.75 pounds. Okay. And RAY is equal to 606.25. Pounds. Now the outlook changes a little bit, right? When I, now that I know those values, and RAX, by the way, that one's equal to zero. What that means is that now I have two spots, actually, on this overall scheme where I have free body diagrams where I only have two things I don't know, right? Either one of them could be a good place to start the process. So which one would you like to choose? A? Sounds good to me. Okay. So I'll just draw, I'll, right now we're focusing on this free body diagram over here, right? And we're going to write some equations. Matter of fact, just to be totally clear, let me copy this and go down here. Okay, I'm going to write equations for this free body diagram. Like what equations? Okay. Some forces in the X and some forces in the Y. Of those two, which one is best for us to do first? Okay. So think about this. <coughs> in the X direction, there are two variables I have up there that I don't know the values for that have x components. Okay? So those two, you know, would make an equation where I couldn't solve it right away. On the other hand, if I sum forces in the y direction, what we'll find there is that I ha I'll have RAY which is going to be 606.25 pounds minus the y component of TAG right, which is just going to be TAG multiplied by 4 over the square root of 4 squared plus 5 squared. Any other forces that act in the y direction at joint A? Nope, that's it. And therefore, I can easily solve for TAG. Okay, so T AG then is going to be equal to, okay, let me uh, tell you what, I'm going to put, um, I want to store a value here, and that value is going to be the square root of 4 squared plus 5 squared. I'm going to need that a lot, okay? So square root of 41, um, let me put that into just variable A. That way I'll have it to use. So that's just a matter of convenience there. So how do I get TAG? You can do a bunch of this in your head, but you can think about moving TAG, the TAG term, to the other side of the expression, and then dividing both sides by 4 and multiplying both sides by the square root. Right? So what that will end up giving you is that 606.25 times the square root I just found, which I have stored in A, divided by 4. And that tells me that TAG had better have a value of 970.5, we'll say, pounds. Okay. 
Now, did I, I didn't talk much about the, uh, the sign of my solution. Did I, did I get my sign correct for, for the TAG, 970.5? Yeah, the sign is correct there. What does that mean? It means I assumed, what I assumed is in fact what it is doing. So I assumed tension, came up with a positive answer, means that assumption was correct. Okay? All right, let's go to the next one. How do I get the, uh, the next one? Some forces in the X. So for that, I need to sum up all my X components. So I will have a TAB plus TAG, right? Which TAG we just found to be 970.5 pounds. But I don't want the entire TAG. What do I want? the x component of it. So to get the x component of it, I need to multiply by 5 over the square root of 4 squared plus 5 squared. Okay, And based on this, we can say that TAB has to be equal to, all right, we would need to move the 970 to the other side of the expression, which would make it negative, right, to, make, to do that. Uh, solution right there and find TAB. Okay, so I take that 970.4 or 0.5 and multiply it by 5 over the square root of, well, I had that stored, didn't I? So let's just put it in there. Okay. 757.8 pounds. And I said it, but then I didn't write it. What, what do I need to do with the sign? Negative 757.8. Okay, and the sign means what? Okay, because I assume tension, the negative sign there means it must actually have compression carried in it. Okay. Some people at this point like to go through and flip the arrows of the ones that they find were incorrect. Okay? There's two ways, there's, there's two ways I think about that. If your main point is to try to show someone conceptually what direction all the forces are acting, then that would be a good idea to, to flip the arrows. But that's about the only time I think that's a good idea. Okay? I think it's a better idea in most cases to go ahead and leave them the direction that they're shown and let the signs speak for themselves, right? You have a negative tension of 757.8 acting on uh, joint A, right, instead of a positive tension. And you can interpret that as a compression. Okay, wonderful. We did the first one. What do you want to go to now? B. We'll just keep working. Okay. Um, if I move to B, how many unknowns do I have there? Okay. We could jump over to D, right? Because if I go to B, I can write some equations. I just might not get immediate satisfaction, right? And we are all about immediate satisfaction here. Okay? Can't get no. You guys, you're not giving me anything here. It's Friday. We are not allowed to be jovial on a day like Friday. All right. So let's go to joint D, and let's do it a little quicker this time, okay? What direction is easiest for us to start with, uh, with D? Y again, right? Because I only have one thing that has an unknown Y component. Yes, yes. Yes. Okay, 
the question was, uh, on the previous one where we did the summation in the x direction, what do we do with RAx? And it would certainly be fine if we wanted to add a term here plus 0, right? Because we said, based on this last thing we did up here where we did the free body diagram of the whole thing, we made a comment and said RAx would have to be 0, right? Because if you sum forces in the x direction for the whole thing, there isn't anything else. So RAx would have to be 0. So when we keep that in mind and bring it down here, you basically, I, I ignored it, I didn't mention it, but uh, you know, we, we can remember that that was 0, so it won't have an effect in the, gotcha. OK. So um, now, in the y direction, we've got minus TDE, but not all of TDE. Which component do I need? Or how do I get the component I need? Multiply by 4 over the square root of what? 4 squared plus 6 squared. Okay, and to this I will add R D Y. Okay. Which let me go ahead and write that in. The value of R D Y is known. It's five ninety three point seven five. Pounds. Okay. So let me get that in here real quick. Um, I've got five ninety three. 0.75, which I will multiply by the square root of 4 squared plus 6 squared, and then divide that by 4. 1,070.4. And this would be T, D, E. Okay, did I get my sign correct? Okay, I did because one of those terms would have to move to the other side and then the signs would, would match for the two when they did that. Um, and so that means the fact that I got the sign correct and it's positive, it means my assumption for, for DE, that it was intention, was correct. Okay, and I'll move on and do a sum of forces in the X direction. Okay, here I've got minus TDE, which I now know, right? So minus, the minus comes from the fact that it points to the left, and then I put in the value of 1070.4 pounds. I don't want all of that, though. I want just the component that points in the horizontal direction. So I need to multiply this by 6 over the square root of 4 squared plus 6 squared. Okay. And what else do I need to put here? Minus TCD. And this is going to be equal to 0. No other x components that I have to deal with there. Okay. So based on this, you might notice here those two terms have the same sign to them. So when I move one of the terms to the other side of the expression, I'd end up with a negative, right? So that means that my TCD is going to end up being just the value I got there, 1070.39, multiplied by 6 and divided by this square root of 4 squared plus 6 squared, 890.625. And again, I, I mentioned it, but then I failed to write it. Okay, this one should be negative. Okay, and the negative means what? Okay, again, it means we assume tension. It's the opposite of what we assumed, which is compression. All right. So we've, we've made some progress, right? We've found, if we actually think of what everything we've found so far, 
we had 12 things we didn't know, right? But then we found three of them by our first free body diagram of the whole thing. And now we've just found four more. So we are over halfway there. Isn't that great? Yeah. I knew you'd be excited. Maybe not excited about bad jokes, but you're excited about that. All right. What's that? That's right. We enjoy getting our math done, but we do not enjoy having fun. All right, what do we do next? Okay, so we could try to go to point G. We gotta be, we gotta be smart though about which way we go with this thing. Look at G, right? We know what? Okay, we know TAG, right? We actually do know the 500 pounds. And that means we only have two things we don't know. So yeah, we certainly could do joint G. OK. Is that what everyone wants to do? May as well. Nothing else is fun either. We better do this one. We should have an Eeyore club here. All right, so let me, uh, what do we, where do we start with this one? Okay. Think of which direction do I have, um, you know, uh, which direction do I, do I have just one variable that has a component in that direction? And so a lot of you are answering why. And some of you are answering X. Who's right? Both of you are right. Okay, because the, the forces there align with the two different directions of the axes. So neither one of them is going to have a component of the other one. Does that make sense? One of them is going to be entirely X, the other one's going to be entirely Y. So you can do either one you want. Okay? So which one would you like to do first? X? Okay, rightward being positive. So I'll have TEG does not need to be multiplied anything because it's already pointing entirely in the X. And what else? Minus TAG, minus because the arrow points generally left, right? Um, but I don't want the entire TAG. I want it to be multiplied by what? 5 over square root of 4 squared plus 5 squared, OK? And let me do this, too. Do I know TAG? I sure do. So let me just go ahead and put that value in there, 970.5 pounds. So that sums to 0, which means TEG is going to be equal to <clears throat> 970.5 times 5 divided by the square root of 4 squared plus 5 squared. 757.8 pounds. And I didn't put any, uh, I didn't put a minus sign on it or anything like that. Is that correct? It is, because again, if you move one of those terms to the other side, the signs will match, right? <clears throat> All right. Now we'll do Y. Okay, in the Y direction. I'm going to have uh, TBG then what? Okay. Plus just the Y component of TAG. 
Okay, let me actually put in the value of TAG, 970.5 pounds. Okay, I want just the vertical component, so I multiply by 4 over the square root of 4 squared plus 5 squared. Okay, minus 500, good job. So we need to make sure we don't forget those uh, applied forces, the 500 there. Does that cover all of my y direction forces? It does. And so TBG then, oops, TBG. is going to be equal to uh, 500 minus 970.5 times 4 over the square root of 4 squared plus 5 squared. Okay, which gives me negative 106.27. pounds. And because everything is assumed to be in tension, that negative means it's actually in compression. All right. You tired yet? Are you energized? You're uh you're loving life right now? Absolutely. All right. We have uh, just a little bit further to go. What's our next one we should look at? Yeah, I like that a lot. Someone says, can we do C? It looks easy. All right. I like that idea a lot. Let's look at C. <clears throat> Okay. Now keep in mind, we actually do know this value right here, TCD, right? TCD is equal to negative 890.625 pounds. Okay. So what do we do with this? Some forces in the X, and we'll have minus TBC plus a minus 890.625 pounds equals zero. So what's TBC? Okay, same thing, minus 890.625 pounds. You're right, that was easy. And yet, not the easiest one. There's one easier. Summing forces in the Y for this free body diagram, we have minus TCE. equals zero. CE is what's known as a zero force member. It means it's there, but it's not carrying any force. So it's not helping the truss at all? As the question is, is a common one that comes up. It says, so it's not helping the truss at all? Okay. Yes and no. Okay, so a zero force member is certainly not carrying any load, but let's try to think what would happen if it wasn't there. Okay, so we just said BC is carrying tension and CD is carrying, excuse me, BC is carrying compression and CD is carrying compression. So what you're actually having there 
is a long slender member butting up against another long slender member in compression. What will happen based on your experience with things like that? Will it do this? Okay, so the answer to that is, yeah, CE is not carrying any force, but if it wasn't there, it wouldn't be there to keep that thing from buckling. So, just a couple of things with that. If we find a zero force member, and we are trying to analyze all the forces in all the members of the truss, we can take it out and it won't affect our analysis. Okay? So from that standpoint, no, it's not doing anything. You can take it out and it won't affect anything. In terms of the physical structure, there might be a real good reason to have some zero force members in it sometimes if what it's there for is to stabilize long members that are in compression. Okay? So that's, uh, that's the answer to that question. All right. What do we lack? Okay. I think we need to do one more free body diagram. Which one would you like to do? Okay. I think the only two we haven't done so far are which ones? B and E. Is that right? B and E. Which one looks easier? B looks easier. Why? There's fewer forces acting on it, right? So, I like that idea. So let me grab that free body diagram and we'll get her done. Okay, so what don't we know on here? TBE? Is that the only thing we don't know on there? Yeah, so what would be the easiest thing for us to do to find TBE? Probably the Y direction, right? I'm all about trying to do it easy. All right, do the easy thing first if we can. So for this, I have minus TBG, and TBG is minus 106.27 pounds. Okay. The first minus is because the arrow points downward. The second minus is because the value I found for TBG earlier was negative. Okay. So I think it's helpful, especially at first when you start doing these, to carry all those signs because I think it helps you not make so many mistakes usually. All right, then what? Minus TBE, but just the vertical component, right? So I need to multiply by 4 over the square root of 4 squared plus 5 squared. And that's equal to zero. So TBE then, <clears throat> okay, is going to actually be, so this one, the, there's a bunch of sign changes, right? So if you look at it, the two terms that I have actually have opposite signs, right? So if I move one of them to the other side of the expression, they'll have the same sign. And that means that my conclusion for TBE should be that it'll be positive. Okay, so let's do this. Uh, we'll take 106.27, multiply it by the square root of 4 squared plus 5 squared, and divide that by 4. 170.11, or 1, 2. Positive is correct there. Yeah. OK, 
Okay, his question is, he rounded a little bit differently, um, and so he came up with a little bit different answer, and his question is, would that be okay if, I, if you made a mistake like that on a, not a mistake so much as a, just a you know, accumulation of error as you went along? Um, the answer to that is, if you think about the nature of the test that we put in this class, it, uh, we don't give you a ton of time per problem, okay? So I'll let you surmise what you want to about whether or not you're going to have a long stack up uh, of, solution, you know, of, of steps like that. Um, I would say if it feels like you are for some reason, I, you know, I don't anticipate you will, but if you do feel like you're starting to do this solution where you have a long stack up of, uh, of steps, then it probably is a good idea for you to try to carry one or two more decimal places than you otherwise would have, okay? But that, it doesn't happen much and, and you know, might not happen at all. Okay, now what? We're only missing one thing, I think, right? Or are we? We got everything? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. We do, we have everything, don't we? And we didn't even have to use one of our free body diagrams. Okay. So let me ask you this question. Could we use the extra free body diagram for anything that would be useful? It is an independent method of verification whether or not you got everything right. And you guys are pretty smart, so I think I'm going to forego doing that, like, you know, formally here. But I'll leave it as an exercise if it's something that you want to try to do where you basically take these answers and try to plug them into our last free body diagram at E, plug in all those values, and make sure that whatever you have sums to zero in both the x direction and the y direction. Because if it doesn't, then you start worrying whether you did something wrong. Okay, his question is, or his statement is, we're not going to have time to do that on the exam. Therefore, it is not worth knowing. Because if it's not on the exam, it is not worth knowing. Everything I know that is worthwhile has been on an exam that I have taken in my life. Okay? Just so you know, right? Good. Glad, I'm glad everyone understands. Very nice. All right. Let's go on because there is one last thing that we want to touch on. Okay? We wound up having that zero force member, right, in that one that we just analyzed. And that's kind of interesting. It sort of popped up out of nowhere. And as we were talking about it, we said we could remove that zero force member and it would have no effect on the analysis of the truss. So wouldn't it be handy if we could figure out which ones were going to be zero force member before we ever started doing any of it, right? And if you can, you might be able to simplify down your truss, significantly even, okay? So here's how you know. What you want to do is you want to take a look at your truss and look, you're, you're looking for joints, okay? How you know whether or not a member is going to be a zero force member involves you looking at joints, okay? And you want to find joints with these characteristics. You want to find a joint that has exactly three members attached, okay, at that joint. You want two of those members to be collinear with one another, right? The lines of action in those two members need to be collinear with one another, whereas the third one is not, okay? So you have exactly three members, two of which have collinear lines of action and one of them does not have a collinear line of action. Okay, right. And you don't want to have any external loads applied to that joint. So if you find a joint that meets all three of these criteria, then you can presume that the member that is the third one that is not collinear, right? Remember you had the two that were and the third one that was not, 
that third member will be a zero force member. Okay? And once you find that, uh, that zero force member, you can, re you can literally erase it out of, the, out of the structure, out of the truss, and go on with your analysis, and it won't change anything, okay, as far as your analysis is concerned. Shall we practice it a little bit? Okay. There's a truss. Okay, and I'll tell you what, let me, I'll try to get all this on the page at the same time. So you can, yeah, I know the, uh, the rules there are probably very new. So let's try to get it all on there at the same time. You want to find members where exactly three members, or excuse me, joints, where exactly three members are attached. Okay? So what would be some candidates? Okay? So BK, you're looking at member BK, but remember you're looking for joints. So specifically, which joint would you like to look at with BK? Joint K. All right, so you're looking at this joint right here. You're saying there's three members attached right there. Two of them, AK and JK, are collinear, or close enough, right? They're supposed to be collinear. One of them's not, BK, and no external forces are being applied at K. So what can I do? Yeah? No. Just the joint, because you do all of this analysis by looking at a joint, right? So you're looking at joint K. You're not looking at joint B, okay? You found joint K. It has three members, two of which are collinear, one of which is not, with no external applied loads on K. And you say, awesome, I can erase BK because I know it's a zero force member. So you erase it. And now you get to do another search. Anything else that looks like might be a zero force member or another joint, really, right? We're looking for a joint where exactly three members are, are attached, two of which are collinear and one is not. B. Now that I got rid of BK, joint B now fits those criteria. So I can erase BJ. Okay, so now I get to look again. Someone says C. Yeah, don't look at C. C doesn't have exactly three members attached, but you can look at joint J, right? Exactly three members attached at joint J, two of which are collinear, one is not. The one that is not is a zero force member, so I can get rid of it. D, joint at D. You've got two members that are collinear, CD and DE. One is not, DI. No externally applied loads at D. And therefore, DI must be a zero force member. All right. Anything else? Yeah. The question was just now, I know there have to be two that are collinear and one that's not, but the one that's not, does the one that's not have to be perpendicular or can it be at any sort of angle relative to the collinear parts? Is that the question? Okay. Let's look at it from a theory point of view, right, to answer that question. So let's say we're looking at some random joint that looks like it might be a zero force member. Uh, or it might be a place where a zero force member might occur, but we're looking at this other member that comes in here and we're saying it is definitely not perpendicular. Okay? So let me say this. What if, you know, we know there must be forces being applied along each of those members, or there's at least potentially a force going like this way, this way, and this way, right? Whose job is it to apply, if I'm going to do a free body diagram for that joint, whose job is it to apply the coordinate system or the, the reference frame? 
yours. You get to choose it, right? So what if I choose a reference frame such that I point one of my directions this way and one of my directions this way? There's x and there's y. x is lined up with the collinear members and y is lined up, you know, it's just perpendicular. It's not lined up with anything. It's perpendicular to x. Okay? Now what if I go about trying to find uh, the sum of forces in the y direction for that free body diagram? Okay? There is only one force component in the y direction. Therefore, that force component must be zero. Right? There's nothing to balance it, and it's a statics problem. Right? If this was a dynamics problem, it'd be a different story. Right? But it's a statics problem, and so uh, there must not be any force in that member, regardless of whether it was perpendicular. Okay? And this is, that's the theory that makes those conditions that I listed up there true. All right, are we done? All right, I knew someone was going to go there, right? Look at H. Be careful with that, right? H has reaction forces on it. Those are externally applied forces, and therefore, that would mess up your conclusions, right? So you don't want to erase EH. Although that'd be real handy if you did, right? What about C? Exactly three members are joined at C. There aren't any two collinear with each other, so I can't do it at C. All right? All right, let me actually blow your mind a little bit more because there are times when sometimes you have uh, zero force members that arise from other conditions besides these. These always work, but there are other conditions that can create zero force members as well. You want me to show you? What if this 500 pound force was not here? Now look at joint G. Okay? And imagine summing forces at G in the Y direction. Okay? G, if you actually tracked what those forces might be in G, there would be one that would be coming uh, along that member and another one that would be coming along this member. So G has a Y component, but there are, are no other Y components acting on G. What's our conclusion? Okay, the conclusion is that EG must be a zero force member. Okay, that wasn't true until I got rid of that 500 pounds a second ago, right? The 500 pounds that existed on there made it to where EG and GH had to carry load. But when I got rid of it, it's not carrying load anymore. And if I get rid of EG, Say, well, that's got to be a zero force member. Right? Now, GH also has to be a zero force member. Okay? So none of that mattered over there as long as that 500 pounds is gone. But it had to be there to carry the 500 pounds when we did have it there. Okay? Obviously. You can't just have a disembodied force hanging out there. Um, so, does that make sense? Wonderful. I hope your day looks up. This has been pretty terrible here today. And uh, I'm, I'm very, you did. He thought it was fun. Look him up, everybody. Maybe you can learn how to have fun in here, too. I'll see you next week.